Hello, I'm Lewis MacLeod and welcome to Speak Up on BBC Radio Scotland, where I'll be looking at voiceovers. You know, this kind of thing. If you love sliding down banisters, you'll love the new banister world. Halfway down Robertson Street, we've got the longest banister in the world. Slide down in luxury as you pass scenes of rural splendour and hideous war. So give yourself a shove and slide down now to Bannister World. Terms and conditions apply. Your home is at risk if you set fire to it. See price for details. Discounts for OAPs. That was a classic radio commercial there, recorded back in 1974 for a company specialising in banisters. Sadly, though, the demand for three-mile long banisters was small and the business closed after a week. The world of voiceovers has been my profession since I pretty much left school. You might have heard me recording commercials for banks, cheeses, yogurts, aeroplanes, floor cleaners. You may have heard me trailing movies and currently voicing a certain postman called Pat. For the next half an hour, from Comedy Unit Productions, join me as we go on an incredible journey into a magical world from director Gustave Bitaille to meet some of Britain's most popular voices and find out what goes into making a voiceover voice. We'll be talking to some of Britain's best-known voices. I'll be chatting to the X Factor's Peter Dixon and comic genius Simon Greeno, voice of Alexander Orlov from the hilarious Meerkat ads. But first up, to give us an insight on how to enter the voiceover profession, I spoke to legendary broadcaster Charles Nove, who had a very interesting start into the business. I started at BBC Radio Scotland in Queen Margaret Drive, Glasgow, now reduced to a heap of rubble, sadly, <laughs> but uh, what a marvellous place it was. Mind you, it was a bit of a heap of rubble in my day, too. But <laughs> I started, they, they decided to launch BBC Radio Scotland as a station in its own right in November 1978, and they advertised for staff to do things, and they advertised for presenters. Uh, so I wrote in, along with just about everybody else in the west of Scotland. And uh, a large number of us got letters back saying, yes, yes, thank you very much, go away. And uh, very luckily for me, a friend of mine who was working there at the time said, it's a mistake, write back and tell them they don't mean it. So I did. <laughs> and what he knew and what I didn't know was that somebody who'd got one of the jobs to be uh, one of the, the launch voices on the new station had uh, got to just a, a few days before launch and decided actually this wasn't for him at all and he wanted out. So oh, really? uh, he disappeared off, uh, <laughs> shaking the dust of the place off his heels. And uh, I came in, I joined the station, I think, uh, two or three days before the launch date. Um, <laughs> and went that on... man was Alex Salmon. <laughs> <laughs> at, uh... <laughs> Never seen nor heard of again. <laughs> yeah, exactly. No, my father paid for a commercial on Radio Clay. That was, that was my end. I was still at school. I was 15 and my, uh, my father figured that well, what we can do is promote my other son's band and uh, get my youngest son to do the voice on it and I loved it and thought it was terrific well, that's obviously led to nothing for you because um, <laughs> you know, you've, you've pursued a sensible career in accountancy ever since. <laughs> You're one of the few people in the business that actually offers a course, uh, you know, training to would-be artists. Yes, I mean, it's it's an interesting question of whether whether you can... Can you teach this stuff or do mm. people have the talent or not have the talent? And the answer is somewhere between the two. There will be people you cannot teach. And in the in the same way as you, there are some people who cannot get a foreign language because they don't have the ear skills, the listening skills to pick up the sounds and the nuances of a foreign language, and that's very much the same. Same with uh, musical instruments too, mm. and same in, in in voiceover. There's some there are some people who will never get it. Right. There are other people who have it by nature and drop straight in and are very good, and maybe just need a bit of tuition in fine-tuning, things to watch out for, and, crucially, how to behave in a studio. So you've got your own facility down in London. Um, so you train from there? Yes, we do. We do training for people who want to be voiceovers and training for people who maybe are already voiceovers but want to work on brushing up a particular part of the skill because it's quite a wide-ranging business. Oh. This, uh, on average, people are exposed to uh, the work of voiceover artists many more times per day than they would ever imagine they are. You know, whether it be the lift that says doors closing, lift going up, or the on-hold message that says, your call is important to us, please hold, you are number 956 in the queue. Yeah, I, uh, that's, that's fascinating, because I, I think that the elevator, the, the woman that does the voice, she sounds terribly unhappy. 
Well, I mean, would you would you be happy being stuck in a lift <laughs> 24 hours a day for years on end? I know that uh, a certain Chris Tarrant used to do voiceovers in, his, in the elevators and that just made all the people in the elevator really unhappy. <laughs> Forward, going up, going up. Yeah, but she sounds like, you know, the doors closing. I've always oh. wanted to get at that for an April Fool's Day. I don't, I've always wanted to get at the, the, the machine that, that makes that and inject spoof messages. You are too fat for this list. Please leave now. <laughs> <laughs> so your people are exposed to the, the work of voiceover artists far more often than they may think. Charles, what advice would you give somebody who wanted to get uh, starting in voiceovers? Well, it's a very competitive business, so clear off and forget all about it and leave it to me. <laughs> um, it's a very competitive business, and people who imagine that you can wander into it and go straight into big money are in for a terrible disappointment. The people who contact folks like me and ask about getting into it, by far the most common thing they say at the start of the phone call is, my friends have told me I've got a really good voice and I ought to be doing something with it. Mm. And... One of the things I always say to them is, that's great having a good voice, but I have to tell you that it's only one part of what's required, and actually, it's not the biggest part. By far, the most important is, can you hear accurately what you're doing, and can you amend what you're doing? Can you fine-tune it to meet what's required of you by the client? And that's about whether you've got the, the musical ear or the language ear. Can you take direction? Can you do it faster? Can you do it slower? Can you indeed cope when the client says, I want that faster but slower, mm -hmm. which they might well ask you for? Yep. Can you maintain a character? If you're doing a character or a particular style, can you maintain that over several hours, several weeks if necessary? Can you maintain enthusiasm? Can you still sound bright and enthusiastic when you're on take 95? And believe me, I have had the the session where you are something like 95 takes into something and some bright spark from the other side of the glass says, you're sounding a bit less enthusiastic than you were earlier on. <laughs> <laughs> really? Well, there's a line I got from a, a producer. Said, it was a trail for, I think, BBC One. And uh, I'd, you know, I'd given them a selection of... You know, I thought fairly decent takes, and then I got this note, Lewis, I'm getting from that read that you're not communicating to a larger audience. <laughs> I thought, no, hang on, this direction's now getting cryptic. <laughs> yes, and I think you, also one of the things I say to people is you have to learn how to behave in a studio, yeah. how to keep the confidence of the client, because one of the things about, from the client's point of view, judging a voiceover performance, it's a subjective decision, isn't it? Mm -hmm. It's really about whether they like it, whether they feel comfortable with it. If you go in there and mark yourself out as a rank beginner from the word go, they may lose confidence in you. And I can tell you one thing for sure, if they lose confidence in you, you could do the voiceover performance of the century, it won't be good enough. Yeah. And they'll it's very subtle, isn't it? And they will decide, actually, that they'd have been better booking Brian Blessed or Joanna Lumley, and they will. Yeah, the direction, I, I, you hear um, clips often from actors, they end up on YouTube, but uh, you know, actors storming out of sessions, it's always entertaining. <laughs> uh, the, the, I suppose the most famous one was Orson Welles um, trying to sell peas, do you mean that one? Uh, yes, yes, the, uh, yes, it all gets too much for him, I think. In July, what do you mean, in July? <laughs> You're such pests. And it can get exasperating for both sides and I'm not having a you know, not having a go at the the production side it's difficult for them often to put into words what it is they want to hear oh, you can really hear that from the client you know and he's really trying you know it's 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 being he's being as polite as he can you know it's take 25 or whatever it is and from the voices side of course mm. you think you're providing what they've said they want to hear but maybe how you've interpreted what they want to hear is not quite how they've interpreted what they want to hear exactly. and you can go round and round in circles and uh, it's a challenge in some cases for people's patience thanks there to charles nove with some of the challenges in the creative process of making a commercial as a mimic there are many performing outlets in the voiceover field which become available to you one actor I've had the pleasure of working with regularly over the years on sketch shows and cartoons is the hilarious Simon Greenall, voice of Alexander Orlov from the Meerkat ads. I asked him how he comes up with his character voices. Well, it's, it's, it's the ear, it's, it's hearing, but also if you're doing a character, certainly if you're doing a foreign character, uh -huh. the, the, the trick is to get it wrong because they, because they get it wrong. Right. You know, it, 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 it's written out in, in very good English, but then use bad English. You can use bad English for, for English characters as well. Uh -huh. Because, you know, in London, like, it's all a double negative, innit? We haven't got none. <laughs> you know what I mean? You come in here and I'll say to him, now, what are you on about? We haven't got none. 
Yeah. You think, yeah, but you can't actually write that, but you, you, can, you can do it. But also with, with Alexander, it is rare that he's used English, but not very good, you know, because, <laughs> his, his, for instance, he said, back hatch car. <laughs> Instead of hatchback. Backhatch back car. Back car. She's driving backhatch car. <laughs> the hatchback of Notre Dame. <laughs> from 5,900 pounds. If you're doing um, cartoons, and uh, how do you avoid the, the kind of overlap? Because uh, you always think... Um, I remember voiceovers, NRITEL used to say to me, there's only like, you know, there's six sort of different voice, like six jokes that you can yeah. kind of come up with. Do you find that a problem sometimes? You... Well, I, I, the thing to do is to is to vary the pitch as well. Not mm. not only play with the accent, but also. I mean, a lot of people like speak very low, so that that gives you like a range, doesn't it? And then you could go right high. You know, if you go yeah. high, then you've got you know another another <laughs> four or five out of that. <laughs> so you can go okay, I'll go high, and then I'll go Geordie. So you go little high Geordie, and it gives a completely. I mean, I'm Sarah Milligan. <laughs> <laughs> So yeah, so you can you can play around with the pitch. So that gives you that gives you like a it's like an overdrive. You go okay, I'll do I'll do Yorkshire, but I'll do I'll do low and high. Well, I auditioned for Alexander, and I went in with the kind of down here. So obviously that wasn't what they wanted, you know. So I've avoided the low end if I can, you know. N note to self: don't do that because <laughs> he's not 15 feet tall. <laughs> the giant meerkat. Yes, exactly. Stalking he's... across the world. <laughs> Lewis, Lewis, it's a meerkat. What? Can you hear you? <laughs> I have seen them with a great long trunk. I know, I know what they look like. We've got them in Scotland, you it's know. A, it's a dinosaur, isn't it? <laughs> Steven Spielberg. You stick with it, boy. I'm with you. I'm with you.